Hi, thank you. Thank you for having me. I see some friends in the audience, some of my students from last semester who I'm very pleased to see, some of my colleagues. Um, so thank you for coming. I never know what kind of audience I'm going to get for the kind of work I do because I'm officially an interdisciplinarian, meaning that I use methods from anthropology, theoretical perspectives from communication studies and media, media studies, and I even draw from my background in folklore, uh, my, my own musical practice, and filmmaking in my work. Um, and of course, Islamic studies is a huge part of what I do as well. So it looks like I've got a really great crowd of people I know from all different corners of the university, which makes me really happy. I hope that I'll be able to speak to all of you today. And if there are questions that I can answer to bring this work closer to your field or your interests, let me know because we'll have plenty of time for questions after my talk, which has lots of media and pictures and bells and whistles and fun things to look at. Um, so you won't just be getting my voice today. In fact, you'll be hearing the voices of some of the women I worked with during my two and a half years of Mellon ACLS fieldwork in Dakar, Senegal, which is the capital of Senegal. Um, a beautiful, brilliant, messy, chaotic, awesome, emergent, extremely creative urban center on the west coast of Africa. And its placement along that coast has a lot to do with the ways in which Senegal has always been a cosmopolitan society. And it speaks to the broader African cosmopolitanism that you'll see underlining a lot of the creativity that I'm highlighting in my talk today. <clears throat> what brought me there um, was the question of how African women use their voices to activate change in the world around them. More specifically, how African Senegalese women who've been steeped in age-old traditions of eloquent speech, traditions of eloquence, particularly women's ritual traditions of eloquence, how contemporary young women and girls in Senegal are using these traditions to transform not only the city that surrounds them and their neighborhoods, not only national discourses that have heavy political weight, but also the broader world. What are they putting out there from these little dusty neighborhoods on the outskirts of the city that can, in many ways, transform the world? And part of my research was to pay very close attention, repeated times, at repeated events, and pay very close attention to the movement of materials at those events. That involves, nice, um, that involves uh, looking at the ways in which people are taking recordings of events that are going on around them. It involves ways that people are trading recordings, the, trading those recordings over tea in the afternoon, paying attention to money as it gets exchanged and spent at different retailers um, during a woman's ritual event, um, and other kinds of materialities. And one of the materialities that was most important to me was digital materialities. I really wanted to pay attention to how the voices of Senegalese women intersect with amplify and even animate, meaning they get inside and push out digital technologies in ways that we may not have uh, thought about before. The overall objective is to recognize and resource those uses, uses of digital media. To say, wait a minute, yes, maybe these um, global youth are not designing websites, but in so many other ways, they are making the important stuff that makes the digital world go around. Um, I am hoping to, this didn't quite work out this semester, but I'm hoping to, in subsequent semesters, teach this amazing course I was able to offer um, with the help of Virginia Tech um, called Digital Africa, Digital Blackness. And it's looking at topics including digital economic justice, black digital innovation, digital futures, African women online, black arts and cultures online. All of these things intersect in the question of digital Africa. What do we mean by Africa? contemporary Africa today, right? How do we ma imagine it in conversation with things like the Twitter revolution? How do we imagine it in conversation with things like global NGOs and development? Um, so I encourage you to keep an eye out. Um, and, I, and I also teach other classes on digital undergrounds, emerging digital movements, aesthetics and digital culture, and other kinds of media, women in media. Um, so I want to start off um, by thinking about how the ethnic traditions, local values, aesthetic practices, and ritual economy intersect with the possibility of digital futures. 
right? So there are a lot of languages by which we imagine what digital globalization might look like. Rarely do those overarching, um, that's what I'm looking for, sort of mainstream ways of talking about digital futures take into account ethnicity or difference or religion or specificity or belief. Right? Although their work is often overlooked in conventional conversations about digital, digital invention, African women engage digital technologies, from the hip-hop recording studio to religious media to pop videos, and perhaps most importantly, social media in ways that contribute to their global social empowerment. So I will detail some of those today. Um, but what I want to start with are a couple of contemporary representations of Africans that we might find online today in the web 2.0, I'm sure most of you are familiar with that term, this sort of new version of the internet that is driven by images, right? Often moving images. It's driven by recordings, media, and lifelike representations of humans. And we saw just as the web 2.0 was really taking hold, what's fascinating is that visual representations of Africa spiked at this time. All of a sudden, we were seeing things like Kony 2012, right? This is 2012. So this is once Web 2.0 really took hold, and YouTube was really, really taking hold as the primary um, entertainment and educational medium, right? Kony 2012. How many of you have heard about Kony 2012? Okay, it was a nonprofit um, initiative um, on the part of some young American people to help depose an African warlord, as they put it, uh, Joseph Kony, um, from he heading up sort of non-governmental troops in the Uganda region. Um, but what was interesting about it was the ways, uh, uh, ultimately, for those of you who don't know, lots of wonderful people got involved in the campaign and got really wrapped up in the idea that we can do something by lending our attention and our funds and our activist instincts to this cause. But what was ultimately disappointing about it was that there were lots of media made, and those media were heart-wrenching, but nothing actually changed. And a lot of those funds were not spent in any ways that would initiate any kind of change, right? So this is, but this is happening. It's activated by and enabled by this Web 2.0. Why is it, okay, and here are a couple other examples. Tinder, yes, Tinder, I, I have no idea, but I'm sure some of our undergraduates have seen it. Um, there is, I actually had an undergraduate do a great project called Humanitarians of T Tinder. Have you heard of this? <laughs> there is a group of people called the Humanitarians of Tinder. For those of you who don't know, it's a dating application where you swipe according to how attractive you think the person in the photo is. Um, where there are groups of people who actually trade and sort of advertise themselves as potential dates, right? By taking pictures of themselves with people who are visually other. And this represents their humanitarianism. We don't actually know. Here's an example of Robbie, 26. Um, this is, um, we don't actually know what Robbie was doing in this place, <laughs> or whether he belonged there, how long he was there for, whether he's a humanitarian or not. This could very well be in the US. Who knows, right, what the context of this photo is. But in this quick flash of an image, we are judging the probability that Robbie has some sort of school-related or humanitarian-related project in a place that is foreign to Americans, i.e. somewhere in Africa, right? Really problematic. Again, the richness of African life is collapsed into this quick, digestible um, symbol for something, something that doesn't really seem to result in any resources for the people in the photo, right? And then we have the Vuvuzelas, really wonderful um, World Cup, Imagery, nothing wrong with the Vuvuzela, right? I mean, we all, we all like, but the problem is that sometimes what all we get to see are representations of African exuberance or African pathos, pathos being suffering, sort of suffering that is part of one's constitution, right? So we're seeing one or the other, but rarely are we seeing the richness and the complexity of African lives. And then we have Tom's shoes. I know we have Tom's shoes in the room today. No offense to anyone who has Tom's shoes. They're not doing anything evil whatsoever. Um, but I do think it's interesting that the Tom's campaign really came to rise with um, the rise of Web 2.0. The notion of young African people and African youth getting very colorful, very beautiful, very nice shoes. 
um, to uh, makes a very quick image that we, when we consume it, we have the idea that whoever's taken the picture or whoever the product represents is a good person who's doing humanitarian work. Again, it doesn't tell us much about the story of what Toms do on the ground, quite literally on the ground. I think for a lot of Africans to receive the shoes, they didn't quite work for a couple different reasons, for economic reasons and for, for environmental reasons. Um, but uh, the notion that that, is, that represents what the lives of these youths are like. They probably needed something. We offered them shoes. They're now happy, right? Done and done. Um, and I want to take a look at, uh, these are small than, smaller than I expected them to be, um, and a little bit triggering, um, but some photos of the African other, right, that comes from traditional visual representations of African others, particularly African women, that are very concerning to me as an anthropologist who comes from a background that trades in this. So we've got a picture of a woman in the Congo, right, by a Belgian colonizer, Right, in this sort of sexy pose, knowing of the great, immense, I mean, heartbreaking violence that was occurring during this time and, and afterward and before. We have a picture of a woman and her child in a German zoo, a human zoo. Um, these persisted up until the 1980s. Um, you see the fence behind and the people in the bowler hats kind of hanging on the fence and watching. These were set up until that time, but we can also think about all kinds of um, pra um, practices of displaying the other that persists today in ways that may not involve live action human humans in a cage, but do involve that gaze, right, that Western gaze. And then we've got um, Sarchi Bartman, um, the Venus Hottentot, it's called the Venus Hottentot, a San woman who was taken from her home and her family um, in southeastern Africa and um, paraded around the world as this example of the feminine African other. Um, if you're interested in those discourses, look around, um, go ahead and Google the Venus Hottentot. And there's been a lot of really interesting blogging, a lot of interesting discourses happening around her recently. Um, another picture from an anthropological study in Polynesia, and I did this just to think about, this isn't just happening in Africa, this is happening worldwide, to people in a region I call the Global South the global south, which can include the American south, or places in the northern part of the US where southern people have lived, or places in the northern US that have economies that resonate with the south. But the global south is any, any economy, any culture that's been deeply marked by uh, colonialism. Okay, so and this can happen in all kinds of different ways. And then here's another San skull that was kind of put forward as different, um, but of course, establishing whose skull is the normal skull and whose skull is the weird skull is very political. Um, so now what do we mean by Africa and what do we mean by blackness, right? What can it be now? In Web 2.0, we are seeing other possibilities emerge for representation. They all can be problematic. They can all be problematic, but I see in each of these the possibility of amplifying something else something more exciting and something more empowering um, to Africans. Here's P Patrice Lumumba, Lumumu, excuse me, Lumumba, um, an image from African independence, right, from 1960, very political image. We do see a lot of imagery from um, the Pan-African movement as sort of a positive representation of Africanness, and this is wonderful and important. The politics are wonderful and important. They may not bear upon our contemporary situation the way we'd like them to. So I ask questions about what kind of nostalgia is attached to the imagery of black leaders, African leaders at the time of the Pan-African movement, right? What kinds of wonderful things can they represent? What kind of problematics, and particularly gender problematics, can they sort of cover up? Um, the idea of contemporary art openings, art uh, displays, involving Picasso and prim primitivism, Right, or fashion and primitivism. On one hand, we're celebrating this idea of, the, of African aesthetics and the immense discourses and knowledges and gnoses, as we say, kinds of knowledge that are often marginalized that go into African aesthetic practices. On one hand, we revere them and we draw from them. On the other hand, we cast them as something magical from the past. 
instead of thinking of them as emergent and in conversation with contemporary circumstances. Right, so possibilities for change and also problematics. And that's what cultural critics do. We get excited about the possibilities. We try to amp those up and kind of tamp down the problematics. And then, of course, we have an image of a young African woman speaking out on a microphone. This is always very exciting to see. And we're seeing more of this lately, which I find very encouraging. Um, but again, representations of African youth politics are very exciting and are a really important place to think about intervention and empowerment. At the same time, politics don't always happen in front of a microphone. They don't always happen at a political rally. They don't always happen in public spaces, right? They often happen in private spaces, ritual spaces, domestic spaces, right? So interpersonal communication. So we want to represent those kinds of politics as well. Okay, so the digital divide. How many of you have heard about the digital divide? A couple of us. Great. I see enthusiastic hands in the air, which is always good. Um, this is the global internet infrastructure. This is just one of a gazillion ways to show that in terms of digital infrastructure, Africa is criminally underdeveloped. underdeveloped right? So where do we even begin to talk about digital Africa? When Africanness and blackness, right? When Africanness has so much purchase, when people are on Web 2.0 and they're flipping through images and all of a sudden they see this image of the African other, it's very exciting. They want to click on it. They want to find out more. It makes them feel like there's something, um, there's some sort of global exchange occurring, right? At the same time, that's not answered with resources being directed toward African self-representation. So, how do we change that, right? So we want to get away from those narratives that are either about African pathos, well, there's something about Africa that just can't develop. What is the problem? It's wars, it's this, it's that, it's disorganization. It's a different way of life, right? We know those to be stereotypes. So knowing that those are wrong, right? And also getting away from those stereotypes of exuberance Right? There's just, there's not enough planning, there's not enough infrastructure, there's not enough thinking out what needs to happen, there's just this attempt to dive into the contemporary economy that's wrong-headed. Neither of these are going to help. So the digital divide means that internet networks are not in place in much of Africa. We see images of Africa, I thought these were very interesting, as a digital dumping ground, and I saw this in Senegal all of the time. It was amazing, I took photos of it. Just keyboards everywhere from the late 90s. Just computer screens everywhere that were completely on the beach. Stacks of computer screens holding the land back from erosion. Oh yes, it was bizarre. So I'd have my drum lessons out on the beach and the wrestlers would be out there practicing. And people would be lifting weights and running in the morning and I'd be playing drums, sitting on a mound of computers, right? Completely defunct. How did they get there? These are interesting questions. Right? When we give money to organizations to send technologies to Africa, what are they getting? Right? Often, these technologies are part of a good deed that an NGO is doing as part of their mission, but they're coming into a place where they have no infrastructure, the stuff's already outdated, nobody's trained on how to use them, and it's essentially just garbage without the space, staff, and stuff, to paraphrase Paul Farmer, the medical anthropologist, the space, staff, and stuff to actually hang on to those technologies and make something of them. So it's really a problem. This is everywhere. And then we have these images that we see all of the time. We see them sometimes in very strong ways, like we do here and here. Sometimes we see them in lesser ways. The idea that echoes that anthropological imagery, that echoes the shoes, right? That there is some there are some groups of people who have been untouched by globalization, which is absolutely untrue. There's no such thing. So the anthropologist. And that when they encounter a computer for the first time, they will be amazed. Everything's going to change. There will be some sort of a revolution. Putting them in contrast to those contemporary digital technologies, okay, it's just a picture and it looks really cool and it will probably bring some extra funds to your organization depending on whose money you're trying to court, um, but at the same time, I argue that those representations are very damaging. 
more damaging than if you had just not helped out at all, or even, even more damaging than that in creating negative representations of African possibilities and African futures, in re, um, repeating stereotypes that have been put forward about African life for a very long time. So this is why ethnographic work is important. There are other kinds of media practices that are unseen, unacknowledged, and unresourced in the hidden practices and hidden practitioners that are the basis of my ethnographic work with women media producers in urban Senegal, I'm finding all kinds of possibility, right? This is why, F oh, so now I wanna talk about a few different modes by which African women are using technologies to perform different modes of self-representation. If one of the major problems here is self-representation, then how can we empower alternative modes of representation? Right? I think there are tons of possibilities, and I'm really excited about some of those possibilities here at Virginia Tech. In fact, um, one of my wonderful students um, is here from last semester, Lena, who made a film about hijabis here at Virginia Tech that is like one of the most amazing things I've ever seen, 10-minute short film um, that practices those modes of self-representation for women in hijab at Virginia Tech, talking about who they are. And one of the most brilliant things about Lena, and it's on YouTube, um, but one of the most brilliant things about Lena's short film is that it's not a string of women just talk in hijab talking about hijab, saying, hey, hijabis aren't like this, hey, hijabis aren't like that. It substitutes, right, that responsiveness for, and I see other women who are in the film in this room, um, that responsiveness for women representing themselves. Hey, I go to the gym or I don't go to the gym. Um, hey, I really like um, Drake. This is what my life is really like. I'm actually a really happy person. This is my story and what I chose. That self-representation is incredibly powerful in the digital age, right? Because Web 2.0 gives the opportunity for stereotypes to become re-entrenched otherwise. And I argue that those resources are available to us, those resources of self-representation. There just needs to be some good folks out there making those resources available. And it requires space, staff, and stuff. So when it comes to media, Dance, writing, and voice. Women's media practices may look different in the global context. It might not look like somebody walking out and saying, okay, here's the story of Joseph Kony and why he is a problem. Right? We don't actually have an African introducing that problem. We don't actually have an African woman <coughs> playing in on her experience with that. At the same time, the media practices are there. They're there. They just don't necessarily look the same. So I want to highlight a couple of different African media practices, African women's media practices that are very important to the lives of women and girls and young people in Senegal today. Um, the first is Ajami, um, a form of, I don't know what, I don't know where I got this image from, but I'm not sure if it's Ajami now that I look at it. Um, Ajami, a form of religious writing in Senegal, which is a 96% Sufi society. Incredible, right? So not only is it 96% Islamic, nearly all Muslims in Senegal who are of the ethnic groups who are considered Senegalese are Sufi, um, which is very interesting. And so there's a lot of devotional poetry and a lot of devotional voicing that's very beautiful. It goes back five, six hundred years in the region. So there are devotional poems written to Allah um, and written to religious leaders in the Wolof language or in the Pular language which has been translated into an Arabic orthography. So it's Arabic lettering, but it's the Wolof language, which is very different from Arabic, and then written down on these papers and distributed that way. So really fascinating. This is a mode of media because these were copied by scribes, and there were many copies of them all put out. Today, if you go to a religious service, everybody gets a copy of one of these. Um, and the copies themselves kind of carry a baraka or a baraka, a blessing with them. And they have the special poetry and everyone chants them together. So when it comes to media, right, Marshall McLuhan says, a medium is any technology by which a body affects other bodies, by which a body extends itself to affect other bodies. How does the body of the writer, right, of the Ajami, extend him or herself, and there were many women writing these actually, to Allah, right? How does the body of the writer extend herself to groups of people who are then going to recite her work? Isn't this a little bit like social media? 
tiny bit, just a tiny bit, I know, it's a little bit of a reach, but sociality and using media like the voice and like writing and like dance to communicate with other groups of people and to have them pass that along, that's as old as humanity is. In fact, it might precede it. Um, so the anthropologist again. Here's another kind of, here's another medium that we often overlook and one that women often, not always, but often have special purchase on, which is dance, the medium of dance. What does dance do? So we can watch a dance and say, what does it say? That's all fine and good, very fascinating. We can interpret it and put something together and sort of make a text out of it. Or we can just watch dance and see what it does. How does it affect the bodies of the onlookers? In my work in Senegal, I won't have a chance to show this today, but I often show this. Often, we think about drummers and musicians as playing the music and women dancers as responding. In Senegal, I discovered in my field work that it's often the women dancing and the drummers have to play whatever they're dancing. And that's not acknowledged. So it's the women at the space of generation, right? We call that natality, following Hannah Arendt. The idea that creativity comes from places we don't see, we can't see private spaces, right? And then becomes public. So in Senegal, they have a circle of um, dancers at a ritual called the Sabar, which has both sort of secular ritual, I should say pre-Islamic ritual, and Islamic ritual valences. You'll hear a little bit more about that in the next 10 or 15 minutes as I finish my talk. Um, but it is a circle of women. The only men allowed are the drummers. And one by one, the women stand in the middle of the circle. This is a picture from my field work, actually. So this is my neighborhood. It's about 3 o'clock in the morning. Yes, it's really wonderful. Um, very loud and fantastic. And this is every night in Senegal, unless it's Ramadan. Every night. Every night. There are no such thing as noise permits in Senegal. Um, and the woman in the center dances. And what she does when she dances, she doesn't just go in there just for the heck of it. She goes in there to gain prestige, to show that she knows the hottest song that's come out, the hottest video, the dance that goes along with it, because that's how pop music works in Senegal. That she can not only do this dance, and she can not only show her own ancestral dance that shows her neighborhood and shows what ethnic group her family is from, Right? She shows all of these things. The dance lasts between 30 seconds and two minutes. And it's always improvisatory. Um, and then she also shows that she can come up with a bach or a particular rhythm or contortion or movement all of her own. Right? And that moment of the dance is called jahase. It's when you get very excited and heated. So yadam defatang, your body's hot. And that's when you really create. And then thirdly, there is a medium that I'm particularly interested in, those traditions of eloquence I was talking about before, the voice. So what you're about to see here is um, a piece of my uh, footage from my field work. I'm actually working on a film about this right now with Sadia Rai, who is my graduate assistant. She's fabulous. And we are putting some of this footage together to make a film. But um, this is a woman who had a baby a week before. This is the naming ceremony for the baby. The baby got this wonderful, very well-liked, Islamic name, Bamba, and um, the baby is being sung to by a griot, um, a woman griot. A woman griot meaning a praise singer who's hired for the occasion. And the louder and the more eloquent she gets, the more money they stuff in her hand. In that act of singing this woman, right, the celebrant, celebre, and in the act of singing the woman who had the baby, she is actually lending um, prestige to the woman. And that prestige becomes like money in the bank in Senegal. Knowing that one of the best griots in the neighborhood has come and said these kinds of things to you and use this particular rhythm and this particular song is a big deal. Having it on film is even better. So of course everybody got copies of this footage. But I want you to hear how this is done. Now this is just like the sub art. It's done in a circle. The only men there, there are a couple men there hanging out. There's a cameraman and there's a drummer but largely it's for women and children. Um, and I will tell you what the griot is saying as we listen. It's also called tasu, an early form of rapping. That's a different project. But... She's saying something along the lines of, you are so great. Your mother is so great. She loaned money to this person in my family when we were in need. 
your grandfather gave a cow to this marabou because he was so generous. Everyone in the neighborhood knows that you are good people, right? And as she does this, she's getting money in her hand. Your aunt and uncle are great people. That's money. People in the background are yelling, yes, it's true, it's true. All of these wonderful things you're saying are true. To be publicly sung by a griot like that lends you huge prestige in your family, especially when it's done that well and that impassioned. And this is part of a ceremony that lasted three days. And the women themselves are of the griot caste, which is 10% of the Senegalese population. So all of their friends are also griots. And needless to say, I have tons of really great footage. It was really fun. Um, but thinking about this as a medium, if... As we see in this footage, the voice and what it carries, yes, the words, but even more so the impassioned tone of the voice is like money in the hand, then what are some of the other media practices we can imagine, right, coming out of this model for communication, right, without needing any sort of organized corporation or business? Um, there have been some movements lately, I kind of threw this slide in. But I did want to bring up, there have been some movements lately about recognizing women as media producers, as content providers, as media creators. Um, what's strange is that it's 2016 and this is only starting to take hold. We're only starting to have discourses about women as media producers. Because although we are on the ground making stuff all of the time and mediating all of the time and organizing and communicating, and coming up with new dances and new slang and new modes of communication and new modes of fashion. Rarely do we make it to the level of production where we are recognized and credited as producers. And that's often because we're missing one fundamental step, which is getting our hands on the stuff. Even more so than the training, getting our hands on the stuff. All we got to do is get our hands on it and be empowered to use it. So what do we mean by African futures? The notion of an African future is highly contested and full of possibility. Um, and many discourses were generated out of um, the political media around the Twitter revolution in the Middle East and North Africa. How many of you remember that? Okay, this is 2010, 2011 particularly, when um, African polity, uh, North African polities and Middle Eastern polities uh, leadership is changing. Um, the official reports at the time were saying that this is because youth in these places, Egypt, Morocco, etc., Syria, have gotten their hands on social media, Twitter, Facebook, and that's how these revolutions were um, enabled. And that is true. These did become media for um, political change, but at the same time, they were heavily mediated media, meaning that they didn't always do exactly what the users intended them to do and that there were other people and forces involved who were also influencing what those media were doing. And so it becomes very complicated to try to figure out exactly what kinds of African futures the youth involved in that movement were imagining versus what, let's say, other global forces imagined those African futures looking like. So it's really complicated. But I just wanted to give you a sense of this is not a place yet, um, but this is a Chinese architect drew this vision of one of the outer neighborhoods of Johannesburg, which as you know is very poor and underdeveloped, but this is a site of major development right now. Um, so imagining an African future that has this influence of the Picasso sort of primitivist influence. Um, on one hand, it's very beautiful, but on the other hand, does it represent what Africans need? I don't know enough about the context of this particular project, but you see a lot of architecture that looks like this, being built by the Chinese, particularly North Koreans, um, throughout Africa um, and in Senegal. Then we have something like this, the idea of a, an Afrofuturism. There is a growing Afrofuturism movement that is being fueled by the imaginations of young black people in the U.S., globally throughout the African diaspora, and particularly young people in urban Africa, where they are imagining an alternative future. And there are all kinds of evolution out or like a whole class to teach on this, so come take this up. Um, but there are all kinds of great Afrofuturist films being produced right now by young Africans, particularly out of Nollywood in Nigeria that are just phenomenal. So Afrofuturism, an alternative African future, or something a little bit more tangible, 
young African people, young African women and girls and humans with ideas that can represent themselves. I love photography where Africans are actually looking back at the photographer, right? Instead of being snapped from afar, where you can see that they are having a chance to compose themselves and represent themselves in the photos. Okay, so a couple of places where, knowing that I've got about five minutes left, I'll just run you through, of course, I never have enough time to do all of this stuff. Um, I'll just run, run you through a couple of possibilities for development in the future. Um, this is a picture of a Sufi praise singer, a woman named Sokna Khadiba. This particular strain of Sufism has a lot of women praise singers in Senegal, and you'll see that she's holding in her hand, and also in the poster for this talk, which is wonderful, thank you for that, um, that she's actually holding 10, sometimes 20 different little phones, microphones, my field recorder, all kinds of stuff in her hands at once. What she's doing is, when she sings praises to Allah, and it really is transcendent and beautiful, I may have her voice is being broadcast by loudspeakers throughout the city. So when I lived in Senegal, she's actually since passed away and she was a dear friend. So it's sad. What, what's reassuring to me is that I can hear her voice anytime. Because when I was in Senegal for those two and a half years, she was really coming into her own as a praise singer. I could either hear her having a ceremony and go find it, which happened regularly. She did it five nights a week. Or I could, I knew that I would be able to hear a recording of these because people were recording her on their cell phones, then swapping their SIM cards out of their cell phones over T and trading the MP3s or the small um, audio recordings that way, which became decayed over time. Sometimes, so sometimes the recordings you would get were fifth generation or tenth generation. But when she sings, her voice goes out in a million directions, right? To think not only is it being broadcast live throughout the city, it's also being filmed. A lot of these things have surfaced on YouTube in the last two years since her death. Um, and a lot of these recordings are still being dug up and put online and made available. And people are linking to them from their Facebook pages. So thinking about feminine creativity in Senegal, particularly that inspired by Allah, right? Ritual creativity as something that has material weight and extends beyond, right, the boundaries that we think of traditional vocal performance or communication as extending. Can we develop a social media model based on that kind of thinking? Wouldn't that be cool, right? Um, I'm going to skip over some of this. Here's from one of my films about kind of the same thing. And I focused on sound equipment and sonic practices. And it shows the rich Sufi ritual circle and the importance of women. There we go. There's... Okay, so I'll kind of skip through these. And then, of course, a lot of these Sufi women praise singers become the basis for the Senegalese cassette industry, which is now transformed fully into an MP3 industry, pretty much. Um, but when I was there a few years ago, uh, all the taxi drivers had gotten new taxis from Iran. It was some sort of deal and they all had cassette players. And so there was a huge booming um, market for the praise singers on cassette. I'll just skip through that. Um, secondly, we have the recording studio. Um, so uh, this is a rapper I worked with. Her name is Tusa. And she, I first saw her performing a rap at a high school talent show in 2009 when I first came to Senegal and thought she was so phenomenal. She held her own. There were 20 boys rapping in her and she was so phenomenal that I asked her if I could work with her and I spent the next two and a half years kind of following her around. And then she's been out to the U.S. twice for two long trips and stayed with me. She was able to visit my students at William & Mary. She's really phenomenal and through all of this work she's managed to start the first all women's recording studio run by women and for women just by getting her hands on a laptop. We had a dance party, raised some money, bought her a laptop, got her lots of um, tutorials in the French language she could use to learn to use the equipment and all the peripherals and equipment she needed. And she started the studio and it's been phenomenally popular. Here's her in a circle of rappers from the middle of my research. And here's her now um, with her new mixtape coming out from her new studio. I don't 
This is so good. We could just watch the whole thing. But um, but when Tusa stayed with me and when I continue to work with her, I find she's completely, constantly plugged into social media. I would say 90% of her work as an artist is about promotion on social media. So she's got a meme maker, right? Somebody who makes sort of online digital um, uh, flyers for her. She gets a new one every day, right? So she's got a meme maker. She's got videos that she's constantly putting up online. Basically, all she did when she was in um, Colonial Williamsburg with me is ask me to make films for her and upload them to YouTube. So we did tons of that, selfies, etc. Her online promotion is the core of getting the prestige that she needs. Not only does that draw from the contemporary model of hip-hop promotion, it also draws from the immensely important model of prestige and praise singing that the Senegalese already had in place. Another really good one, and then I'll flip to the end of this, the talk, is digital film. I'm working on an article about this really slowly, very slowly right now, so one day you'll be able to read about this, but I do have a document open um, about selfies and Senegalese culture. Senegalese women have often been touted as the most fashionable women in the world. I don't know if that's fair, but boy, they are really good at dressing um, and clothing and cloth wealth. Wealth that's represented by how much clothing you have are the foundation of the Senegalese feminine political economy. Beth Ann Bugenhagen has a great book out about that if you want to talk about that. Um, when, as soon as photography was introduced in Senegal, women sort of hijacked it from being this sort of anthropological thing that was supposed to show village life and made it into self-representations of themselves in their best clothes. And so today, when you go to um, someone's house to visit them, to do a seti, which means spending the afternoon and having tea with them, the first thing they do is take their album that's like this big, that are stacks of photos that they get at each of these sabar events, at each of those Sufi praise ritual events, at all of these events, there, there's a photographer who runs around, takes a picture of every single person there, runs back to the studio, prints all of the pictures. They're usually very high quality and nice, and they usually use film. I don't know how they do it so quickly. Mm -hmm. Runs back to the event and charges about a dollar, which is a lot of money for the Senegalese. Um, charges about a dollar for a nice print of it. So if you're feeling especially cute, you're going to pay for it. You can choose to pay for it or not. If you don't like it, if they don't do a good job, you don't pay for it. They still make money on it. It's really fascinating. So I'd love to just have piles of the unbought ones. But um, yeah, so then you've got a chronicle of your life. So both you've both got the cloth that you own in your closet, and you've got a chronicle of all the outfits that you've worn. Prestige. Prestige. So the selfie is a way of showing one's access to the finest things, meaning that someone has bought this for you. You have gotten the best couture. You've got an excellent tailor. You have a great sense of style. You represent your chosan, meaning your traditional culture, that you have respect for your elders and that you've chosen clothing that's both fashionable and to Europeans and that engages your own ethnic culture. And so these selfies have been the thing in Senegal for a very long time. Um, so you still see it today. Extremely popular. How does that work on... Oh, boy, this, this did not work out well. Let me see if I can blow it up for you. Um, here's an example of Tusa doing the same thing. How do people use um, Facebook and send it all today? They put up a picture of themselves and they tag, right? Instead of going out into the public square, the young people put up a photo of themselves and they tag like 51, 52, 80 people in it. And it appears on everybody's Facebook wall. <laughs> So anybody who's my Facebook friend, of course I don't Facebook friend my students, so you wouldn't know, but knows that I'm constantly like taking down, I get five, ten pictures tagged, because I have a lot of Facebook friends a day, because you put, you tag the people who have the most friends on your list, of course. So you can really broadcast your image to everyone. Practices of self-representation, right? And then there's film. I'm going to skip right through this. Films about... Um, the poor women in Senegal who become maids to middle-class urban Senegalese and their plights is not only the object of the subject of books being written by Senegalese women authors, which is a huge thing in Senegal. In fact, there are tons and tons of very successful 
women novelists throughout Africa um, who have grown up in circumstances where they're very good at storytelling, right? And who have managed to write novels, they're also becoming filmmakers. And when they couldn't afford film technologies, they are getting access to digital technologies. And so we're seeing this explosion of young women filmmakers right now. So the film becomes um, a, an opportunity for young women to influence national discourses on how poor young women are treated when they're brought from the countryside to work for these families. And there have been new laws enacted because of the music video I was just starting to show you from Sista Njaya, who's one of the artists I was able to work with. And then there's the Sufi web, where, and YouTube, um, where the web, web design itself is being used in what I call off-label ways. You're making these web designs that seem very kind of crazy to people who are used to Western web design, but you use the web design in such a way that it's infused with media that can give you the sensation of being in a Sufi ritual. Why is that important? For Sufis who use the voice and sensation and embodiment and dance to have communion with Allah, right? You have a path to Allah. That can be your voice. That can be your devotion. That can be your plan for life. It can also be the act of being in Allah, right? In a worshipful space. For the Senegalese in diaspora who are unable to go to these weekly, nightly, frequent Sufi rituals, they can experience some dimension of this by keeping up to date with their Dieto website. So their group at home in Senegal, right, is constantly updating their page with the latest chants that they've done. I've done a little bit of ethnographic work on this with Senegalese women, Senegalese migrants in the outskirts of Richmond, Virginia, and North Carolina as well, um, where they actually broadcast their home Dieto's chants on their big TVs, and they borrow a big sound system and fill the Section 8 housing with the sound of these beautiful Sufi chants for the entire evening, and it's phenomenal. So taking a space that is so foreign and so not yours and transforming it through the medium of sound, right, is really remarkable. How does all of this add up? In closing, we think about prestige, political communication, aesthetics, storytelling, religious experience, and economic business and educational networks as all potential sites for African digital creativity, particularly that which can empower African women. Let's do it. <laughs> Let's do it. I can think of all kinds of different ways that some of the people in this room who I recognize and some of the people on campus whose names I'm beginning to recognize can contribute to this. We change discourses and we change the representations and we talk about how these are possible ways to activate this. And lastly, where can we resource this kind of empowerment? Keep a current research program and ethnographic partnerships in place in order for me to know the things I told you about today, I needed to do extended, engaged, in-depth, collaborative research for six years in the Wolof language where I had my body in domestic spaces and in private spaces and in ritual spaces so I even knew what in the heck was going on in the first place, but it's a whole lot more detailed than those Web 2.0 representations we talked about before. Equipment and programs exclusively for women and girls. So it's great to do youth programs and it's really important. There is a special intervention to be made for African women and girls, right? There must be a safe, sovereign space for them to do their work where it is just women and girls because of the politics of that. Education and using software, troubleshooting hardware, programming and coding, space, staff, and stuff, as Paul Farmer says. Infrastructure for equipment sharing and upkeep. That is one of the reasons that um, these wonderful African cities become dumping grounds for unusable digital stuff. And finally, cultural responsive networking and, prom and programming. What if Facebook were transposed into a Senegalese sensitive media network that was all about tagging your friends and that could work in a way that actually um, empowers that and doesn't get people caught and reprimanded and um, cut off from their Facebook access. So let's think about that. Let's keep talking about that. I'm around. I'm happy to get coffee with you anytime. <laughs>